about, uh, some uh, cover letter basics, then we'll go into breakout rooms, and then we're going to debrief, debrief from the breakout rooms for about five, 10 minutes afterwards, just so we can see if you guys have any interesting conversations uh, while you were in there. But before we go ahead and get started, um, I'm going to post a link in the chat to uh, Jamboard and you can go on there and we want to answer you to answer two questions. The first of which is what type of library are you aiming to work at? So academic, special, school, public, prison, corporate, other, unsure, something that's not listed there. Uh, go ahead and tell us just what, what you're looking to do. There should be like a little post-it option, a sticky note option. see a lot of academic, wonderful. We are an academic organization, so that's good to see. Um, unsure and starting to freak out because you only have one semester left. It's okay, don't freak out. I will share while people are filling this out. Uh, I was school media slash academic and I applied everywhere. Uh, and I actually ended up, it came down to I interviewed at Geneseo High School in SUNY Oneonta. And the only reason I ended up in academics first is they reached out with a job offer. So it really could come down to the last couple days of your job search. That's true. I have a similar thing. I applied everywhere. I was applying to public. I was applying all over the, the, the state and the nation. Um, and then the first, my first offer was um, for an academic library as well. So. Same for me too. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next question that we have, and that is, where are you in your library science uh, education? So are you just starting out? Are you at the end of your program, middle of your program? Where are you? Have you already graduated and you're working in a professional capacity and aiming to get that librarian position. A lot of people in the middle or the end. It's a good time to start thinking about resumes, definitely. Some folks already graduated. I imagine it was tough graduating during COVID because not a lot of places were hiring during the past year. I think we're just in extraordinary times right now. So um, definitely, I mean, it's stressful, but don't let it stress you out too much. I mean, we're, everybody is in the same boat as you pretty much. Just starting out, awesome. All right, if we take a time, we're gonna, Go back to the presentation. There will be another question at the end of this on Jamboard. So keep, the, keep it up on your screen or something. We'll come back to it, but I will show the link again. So we're gonna start with inside the hiring process and I'm gonna turn it over to Jocelyn. 
Thanks. Uh, so again, I'm uh, Jocelyn Ireland. I've been a librarian uh, total for about 10 years. I started in public and then went to academic. And uh, so I've been on a lot of uh, search committees. Um, I, I realize not everyone here is interested in being an academic librarian, but um, since we're a SUNY Law's academic institution, that's what we're going to focus on today. But if you're interested in talking to a librarian from another type of institution, like a school or a public library, I'll be happy to connect you to somebody. Just uh, shoot me an email and my contact information will be at the end of the presentation. Um, so the process to hire a full-time academic librarian is really long and it's full of red tape. Um, so full-time and part-time positions, they include search committees. So when I was hired, seven people were on my search committee and only three of those seven were part of the library. So the majority of them were not even part of the library institution, but they were people that I that they knew I would be interacting with. So that's why they're part of the committee. So just keep in mind, um, your search committee may not have all like library professionals in it. There's probably going to be a good mixture of different people from all over uh, all over the college campus. Usually there's about five or so people on the committee. Um, so announcements are usually posted to the college's human resources page, and then they usually post that uh, to other listservs. Um, in my opinion, one of the best places to go to look for positions are regional library councils. So I live in central New York and our regional library council is CLRC. So they have a, a job board that libraries can post jobs for free. And a lot of really big job boards like uh, ALA, um, they charge people to post jobs. So um, like small institutions like us, we don't, um, we don't post for really big job boards because we don't want to pay for the posting. Um, so yeah, those regional library council pages are a really good place to go to find regional positions. Um, and they, they'll do a variety of types of libraries, not just academic. Um, so let's see. So they post a position and um, there might be a review date and there might be a deadline date. So just pay attention to that. But if the position is still posted, even if it's been a few weeks, if you're interested and you're, if you're qualified, go ahead and apply. Um, the, they may have already started reviewing applications they may have even started interviewing but they might come back to the candidate pool so don't hesitate if you again if you're qualified and you're really interested and that position has been posted for like a quite a long time go ahead and still apply if it's still there because uh, they might come back to the pool if uh, their first um, goal at, go at interviews was not successful um, so only apply if you're really interested and if you're if you meet the required um, qualifications. You don't want to waste the search committee's time because they have to go through every application and rate them. So if you are applying to like every single position at an institution, the search committee can see that it's all electronic. So if they see you're applying to like six different positions. That's not really a good look. So only apply again if you're really inter interested and meet the qualifications. Um, so at my institution, we rate applications on a, like a five point scale from poor to excellent. So if you at least meet the minimum required um, qualifications, you automatically get into the average pile. And depending on how much preferred qualifications you meet, that'll give you into the above average or potentially excellent pile. Um, so something else to keep in mind, your cover letter and how well your resume is written plays a huge part in getting you, getting you into that like above average pool. Um, so you know, the cover letter is extremely important. And I've seen some online post postings where it doesn't look like the cover letter is required even if it doesn't look like it's required, you still need to um, submit it because that is potentially like one of the most important documents the committee will look at because your written communication skills are really important. And a lot um, of times they are a required qualification. 
All right, so some of my like preferred candidates in the past, they may not have had like the most preferred qualifications as some of the other candidates, but if their cover letter was on point and they obviously put a lot of effort into it and they're trying to tie their previous job skills into this position, that means a lot to me. So a good written cover letter, to me, that means a lot. Um, so after the committee rates all of the candidates, they typically invite usually like the top 10 candidates for the first initial interview. That could be a phone or uh, some sort of online conference uh, interview. Um, Zoom is becoming a lot more popular for that first interview. Um, so that first interview is usually pretty short, usually like 20 to 30 minutes. It's not too long. And usually it's about five questions or so long. So it's usually like, you know, why are you applying? Why are you interested? Can you uh, outline your resume and talk about why it's uh, applicable to this job? And potentially just like a couple other questions that are related to the institution or related to the job. They're usually pretty general. And what the committee is really looking at is your like oral communication skills. Um, so in preparation for that phone or Zoom interview, just make sure you're practicing. I always practice out loud to see you know, how is just like just practicing out loud really makes uh, at least me feel a lot more confident going into that first initial phone or Zoom interview. Um, and something else to keep in mind, if you have a choice, if they give you a choice of time slots, like uh, do you want this time, this time, or this time, try to pick the first or the last time slot that they give you. They don't always give you a choice, but if they do, try to pick the first or the last because you stick out more in the search committee's mind. You just do, it happens. Um, so if you get the choice, try to do that. So after the first interview, the committee meets again. Um, they do a little report and list all the uh, candidate strengths and weaknesses. And then they choose usually like the top five to invite for an on-campus interview. Um, so this on-campus interview, it really ranges from institution to institution. It's usually about like a half a day long. So it's several hours long. Uh, sometimes it can last over two days. So you actually have to, like, if you live far away, you have to get like a hotel overnight. And they usually pay for that, by the way. Um, but usually it's about a half a day long. Um, so that second interview, um, usually you're meeting with like the hiring supervisor. So uh, like a lot of libraries, it would be like the library director. Um, then you get interviewed by the search committee. Then you usually have an interview with like a college administrator, uh, like a vice president or a provost or some sort of dean position. And uh, then you meet with the human resources department. Um, but one of the main parts is you usually have some sort of presentation that you have to give. So if part of the job is teaching instruction, they'll have you do a sample lesson, usually like a quick one, not like a full lesson lasting a half an hour. Um, so um, obviously make sure you prepare well for that. Um, and if it is like a sample lesson plan, a teaching, Thing, um, make sure you uh, kind of set the stage that you pretend you're actually teaching college students. And yes, it's really awkward because you're not teaching college students, you're teaching to a bunch of uh, college professionals, but um, it becomes a lot more effective, uh, effective if you are like kind of um, acting on stage and the people can actually get a sense of how you would teach a group of college students. It means more. Yeah, Jocelyn, I'll chime in there. When we hire for an instruction position, if the person doesn't actually interact with us during their presentation, that's going to drop them lower in the final rankings um, than if they come with some sort of an activity. And you don't have to do the first part of your lesson. You can give a 30 second summary of what you would have covered. That's the beauty of everyone already knowing um, library and chip. And then you could say, okay, so I've already introduced myself and we're going to do this keywords activity. Great. So um, after all of those finalist interviews, uh, the committee, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, let me rewind a little bit. Oh, no, mind. 
I'm going to keep on going. I'm sorry. Um, so for the finalists interviews, um, after they're all done, the committee meets with everyone that met that candidate. So like the tour guides, the HR specialists, the, the college administrator that interviewed them, everyone meets and they have a discussion. And again, talking about strengths and weaknesses of the candidates. Um, so the search committee makes this really long report about all the finalists. They submit it to the hiring supervisor and HR. And then ultimately, um, at least in my institution, I think it's the same for most, it's the hiring supervisor and college administrator that makes the final decision on the finalists. It's not necessarily the search committee that makes the decision. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so the finalist gets an offer. Uh, they have to pass like a criminal background check and they have to submit their uh, academic transcripts to prove that, yes, I did um, get my graduate degree. And, um, and uh, yeah, and then if the finalist accepts it and then the search is over, everything's complete, they may potentially um, uh, withdraw and um, not accept the position and then uh, they might offer it to another finalist or the, the search may be declared a failed search and it might start all over again, which is always frustrating. All right, moving on. Just want to include two real fast um, about references. Uh, ah, yes. yes. Those do get checked. So make sure anyone that you include on your reference list knows that they're a reference. It's very, very awkward if um, all of a sudden a reference gets an email or a call asking to be a reference and they either don't want to be um, or they just are taken uh, off guard by it. I've had that happen to me um, and it is incredibly frustrating for that person just because, you know, sometimes you might not have a lot to say or um, provide. Uh, I've had it happen more, not more, uh, from students that I used to supervise, they just wouldn't tell me. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't have much to, um, to say uh, for them. So yeah, always make sure folks know. And if I can- Recommendation. Oh, go ahead, Laura, sorry. Thanks, Logan. Um, my recommendation would be to, I think it's the best practice to ask people before, uh, if they're willing to serve as a reference uh, first. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And on top of that, whenever I've asked someone to serve as a reference, as soon as I get the call for a phone interview, that's the point I reach back out to my references and I say, hey, I just wanted you to know I got a phone interview for this. I'm sending you the materials I sent them um, because you already have them saved. And then that reminds your reference that you applied to this position and use them because several of your references will say, sure, use me for whichever. Uh, but if you send them your cover letter and uh, resume, they can magically remember more than they probably would have from, especially if it's a professor, uh, and they'll be able to talk specifically about what you can do. The same is true when you ask professors for recommendation letters. It's always a good idea to send them um, your resume and maybe some bulleted points. Just to add to what Logan was saying, also, um sending the job description can also be helpful. Yeah. Well, before we move on, I, I think yeah. we should definitely address the question in chat right now, how to approach the entry level job that requires two to three years of experience as a librarian and how that, how much that matters. Don't apply. <laughs> If it says two to three years, I hate to say it, but like if you don't have two to three years experience, obviously that's what they're looking for. Don't waste your time because if I'm not seeing it on your resume, I'm not going to consider you. You probably don't meet the minimum qualifications. Yeah, if it's listed as preferred, give it a chance. But if it's listed as required, I mean, our system, if you don't meet it, you're done. And so you don't want to waste everyone's time and you don't want to become that name to everyone in the library that knows that, I don't think we have a Betty in the chat. Um, I'm just gonna use the name Betty, that Betty has applied to every single position in our library, uh, even though she doesn't uh, 
meet the qualifications. So if Betty applied for the directorship and then Betty applies for the evening supervisor, we're going to know that Betty doesn't really pay attention to the, the job announcement. And if we ask for attention to detail, which several positions will, Betty's already demonstrated that she doesn't have uh, attention to detail. And I apologize if there is a Betty in the chat. Um. Um, so, Leah, we're actually going to talk about what if you don't have uh, any library experience or not enough library experience. We are going to talk about that later. And Jonathan, I want to um, answer your question in the chat, too. I am a former public librarian. Uh, I was a public librarian for uh, over three years uh, before I came to a college. So uh, that is not correct. And I think that um, my public librarian job um, really prepared me well for my current job so that is not true academic librarians academic libraries will happily accept public librarians um, so if you're in the area because you know the type of people that you're going to encounter at the academic library and i just want to add quickly too because i see another uh, thing in here about what if you have 30 years of other business experience um, if the job is specifically asking for library experience, you have to have that, unfortunately. There are times where transferable skills matter, um, but if in the minimum qualifications it says library experience, you have to have some kind. Some um, uh, job descriptions um, and minimum qualifications will specifically say academic experience, but the ones that just say library experience, that, that could be anything. It could be school, it could be public, it could be special library. Okay. Yeah, and you could attempt to spin your 30 years of experience. Um, it, it really depends on what the posting says. If it says library experience and you did librarian type things in a corporate setting, uh, like records management, you could put in your cover letter, and that's the importance of the cover letter when we talk about it later, uh, is to really make the case that what for what your resume alone won't do. And by the way, my library is currently hiring um, for a part timer and no experience is necessary and we're accepting people to apply, even if you haven't gotten your library degree yet, but you're you plan on graduating in the spring. So just put it out there. There are positions out there that don't require experience. But thank you for putting questions in everybody. Um, so this slide, I just want to point out that there are different types of library, library positions that might have a different hiring process. My previous slide with that long roadmap with two different interviews and potentially like a presentation, not all positions require like a presentation and they may not all have two interviews. There are many positions that we've hired for, we only had one final on-campus interview because either our pool was so small and we just invited everyone that was qualified in for a final interview. Um, so just putting it out there. And there's also different types of librarian positions. There's tenure track. Um, my college has tenure track librarians. There's non-tenure track. Um, there's administrative positions. There's paraprofessionals where even though they had their library degree, they still applied to be a paraprofessional just to get their foot in the door. Um, and that hiring press process is typically a lot simpler and not doesn't have as much red tape involved. Um, and then there's also civil service clerk positions where you have to take a civil service exam to uh, even be, um, you know, considered. Uh, but again, you don't need a library degree for those civil service positions, at least, you know, in a public library clerk position. Um, so not saying every single library position out there has that really super long uh, red tape process, um, but the big full time ones uh, librarian positions typically do have that really long process. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, just a quick note on that. Um, take note of the type of track you would be on as well if it's noted in the job application. Um, for academic librarians, uh, not all academic librarians are considered faculty, um, and not all faculty positions are tenure track, um, and it should state what kind of track um, it is in, um, in the job announcement, so take a note of that. 
Yeah, and for state operated campuses. So SUNY has um, campuses that are run by the state and campuses that are run by the counties. The community colleges are typically run by the counties. For the, the state operated libraries, you'll see specific ranks like assistant librarian or senior assistant librarian. Those two names are typically entry level positions. Uh, if you see something that says SL2 or SL3, that's a professional line. Um, so it is not tenure track, but you can get what's called permanency, which is basically the same thing as tenure. Uh, and so just seeing those things uh, can give you some clue in. If you see associate librarian, they want someone with um, experience who's typically been able to pass tenure at a different institution. So just a couple quick things to keep in mind during interviews. Um, you know, I've just been on a ton of interviews myself and also uh, been on the search committee. The vast majority of people are visibly nervous. It is totally okay. Don't be self-conscious if you are like, you know, shaking and your voice is shaking. It's okay. Just breathe. Try to act as confidently as you can. Um, and again, just keep in mind, everyone that's interviewing is probably really nervous too. It's okay, just breathe, do the best you can. So a lot of questions, no matter which library you go to, the same questions get asked a lot. So if you just Google, you know, academic library and interview questions, those are good ones to prepare for. We're also gonna be providing some at the end of this presentation to prepare with the questions that we've used in the past. So make sure you prepare, have some stories ready from your previous positions of like how you uh, handled a difficult situation or a difficult coworker, how you went above and beyond, have stories ready. It's really annoying when you're interviewing somebody and they're just, you know, kind of like, mm, uh, I can't really think of anything right now. It's like, did you prepare? Like you got, you had to know that we're going to ask something like this. So be prepared, have examples ready. And interviewers, they remember stories. They, they like to hear stories about previous positions. That's a good way to remember you by. So when you're in interviewing, make sure you're pleasant with everyone you meet. Even if you're not being asked questions, you're still under the microscope and being interviewed. So hold doors open for people, smile, greet people, be pleasant to the front end staff um, because um, word will get around if you were uh, rude to somebody. It's important. If I can add what Jocelyn was saying um, about being prepared. Uh, one thing I always do for uh, like Zoom interviews is I will just take like an eight and a half by 11 sheet and like jot down notes for the questions that I think I'm going to be asked. Um, that way, if I do get nervous and kind of forget, I can look down at that and see. So that helps me be a little less nervous. Yeah, I always had a cheat sheet that I was studying in my car or in the bathroom before the interview, <laughs> just so everything was fresh on my mind and I was ready to go. And I always ask at the end of every response I've given, and it's an annoying trait for me, but I always ask, have I answered your question? because that gives the search committee a chance to fight for you at that point. Because by the time you're at the interview, they want to be able to hire you, right? They wouldn't have let you come for an interview just to humiliate you. And it, it's, we don't have time for that um, in the library. So just by saying, have I answered your question? They can ask a follow-up or ask you to expand on something. Or if yeah. you missed the mark completely, they will rephrase the question. Um, make sure you have questions prepared too. Um, it's it's really odd when a, when you ask at the candidate at the end of the interview, do you have any questions? They're like, no. If you don't have any questions, just say, actually, you've already answered all my questions. Thank you so much. But do have some questions prepared. Um, just for example, you could ask uh, individuals like, what do you like about working here? It's really illuminating what their responses will be. Um, there's something else. Anyway, so, but the main purpose of this workshop is to talk about resumes and cover letters, so we'll get to that. 
All right. So Adam and I are going to talk about creating a resume and kind of what goes into that. So I'll let you start, Adam. Sure. Okay. So when creating a resume, this is going to be the first key for getting your foot into the door, really. Um, and we really want to stress that there is no one way to write a resume. Um, however, you know, this really isn't the place to get super creative with your resume. <laughs> uh, keep your formatting really simple. Um, I'd say, you know, open yourself to your inner OCD, <laughs> um, making sure everything is aligned, your headers line up, your bullet points aligned throughout the entire document. Um, ensure any date ranges are using the same formatting methods across all content areas. Um, you really want the reviewers to easily scan through your content because um, you, you want to be kind to your reviewers. Uh, remember, they are likely reviewing dozens of applicants. Um, so the easier you make it for them to absorb your content, the better it's going to be for you. Um, I would suggest avoid using any pre-generated resume templates like those found in Microsoft Word. Um, and that's a little bit of a personal bias on myself. Um, they just don't look good. Creating your own format just looks a lot better. Um, avoid things like using creative borders around your resume. Um, please, please, please do not include any headshot photos. Um, I can't, I'm going to stress that right now. Please don't do that. Um, and when uh, providing employment and additional skill details, uh, be very concise and to the point. Um, you want to incorporate things like power words uh, anytime you can um, in, in those additional skills and employment histories. Uh, think, think action words, things like like managed and coordinated, uh, planned, created, or developed, uh, just for a few examples. Um, and take an active voice uh, in your resume. A avoid the passive voice. Um, so for example, passive may include uh, duties included web design, um, whereas you could write an active voice, uh, successfully redesigned the web page. Um, that just sounds a lot better. Um, another suggestion I may have is uh, study some hot topics in the field right now. Uh, include some buzzwords in your cover letter or resume uh, to demonstrate how your currency. Um, I'd say one of the biggest advantages of entry level librarians is is having that perception of having fresh ideas and being agents of change. Um, don't miss out on that opportunity uh, and and show. Show employers that you are on the cutting edge and not, you know, old farts like we are here. Hey, speak for yourself. Um, <laughs> so I, I know Laura threw it in the, the chat, but I just want to again mention um, verbs. Uh, make sure that anything you're currently in a position that you're using the present tense for your verbs and anything that is past employment or past experience that you're using past tense. Uh, because you are no longer doing those things. Um, so just a note on that, just because I, I, I do notice if you don't switch over um, your tenses. Um, and another thing that it, it can go either way uh, for this, um, but uh, your header um, can include uh, your name, of course. Um, People have really stopped putting things like addresses at this point. The search committee and everybody knows, um, you know, where you're from. I mean, it's part of your application, um, so you don't need to include that at the top. Some people will include personal websites. Only do that if it is up to date. If it's a website that you actively keep on top of, um, because if if you're not updating it, it, it that looks really bad. Um, so only include it if it's something that you update frequently. Um, so that's One that. rule that we have is we are not allowed to Google you, um, but if you give us your personal website and you list it, we can then look at it. 
Um, so it's one way to let us see what's there. So the things that your professors all said about your drinking photos on Facebook, um, not exactly true. Um, but if I go to use Google to find your Twitter profile and the drinking photos come up, I'm, I'm going to know that happened. Okay. So a bit on education and experience. So um, for this, you want to always make sure that you're listing um, things in chronological order, but you want the most recent stuff uh, at the top. Um, because we want to see that first. Um, usually for this, I am um, really not looking at your undergraduate experience. <laughs> I want to see that you have your master's. Um, and then in terms of any other kind of work experience, um, I want to see what you're doing most recently um, up top. Uh, make sure that you keep things to four or five bullet posts when uh, bullet points when you're explaining what you did for each job that you list or experience that you had. Uh, anything more than that is kind of excessive. So you want to be short, concise, to the point um, in those. Uh, you also want to make sure that you're targeting experience that makes sense for the job that you're applying to. Um, so if you're applying to be um, a reference librarian and you're including experience of how you went to clown school might not necessarily be relevant. Um, I mean, but who knows? I mean, sometimes I do feel like I'm a, a clown. <laughs> or if it's a theater librarian position, a clown might be super helpful. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, see how you can spin your experiences of whether they should be included or not, um, but definitely be thoughtful of what kind of experiences you're including. You definitely want to tailor your resume to the job in which you are applying to. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I'll say I have in my files, I have a job apps folder and I keep a copy of every cover letter, reference list and um, resume or CV for each position um, because I do slightly tailor them. And sometimes it's just the difference of changing a verb uh, between like, did I present or did I instruct? Things like that. I highly recommend you do that. Um, it has been incredibly useful for me, um, especially when I've been involved, like um, looking for a job. Um, you know, they may have different qualifications, but maybe you really like the language you used uh, when you're, you know, talking about instruction. So you can just grab that and put it into another letter. Um, so yeah, I, I highly recommend what uh, Logan does. I do that as well. So. And another reason to do it is if you noticed you made a shift in your language and they stop calling you, you may have some problematic issues. Um, so you may want to say, oh, they're not calling me when I talk about things this way. So I'm going to go back to when I was getting called. Um, and there is a question in the chat for older career change people. How much past work experience do you include? Um, what if you had experiences on a campus like work study that sort of fits, but it's really old? I would say that you if it fits into the position, because um, I think it's also important to note, uh, you want to kind of separate library experience from other kinds of experience. So at least how I um, recommend doing things is library experience up top. That's the should be the bulk of your experience. If you have library experience, we will talk about it if you don't. Um, and then other relevant experience um, underneath that. Um, usually I would keep it to two or three things that might be relevant. Even that could be a little much, but the main focus should be on that, that library experience and anything else kind of supplements it with maybe transferable skills from other positions um, you know, that, that suit what you will be doing. I don't think anyone in the library field is going to point out that there's a gap in your, cover, in your jobs. The thing that they will notice and you need to explain in a cover letter is if you have several jobs for less than a year or less than two years. Um, you at least need to explain. I was, my first job was at SUNY Oneana. I was there for 10 months. I was applying for another job four months into my current position, but it's because it was where I was from. And so I just, you just explain it in your cover letter and say, you know, this job is closer to home for me and I, I really miss my family, period, done. 
Yeah, I don't really care how old some experience well, is. Like, I understand people go from one career to another. So if you have some re really relevant experience that it's, you know, it's pretty old, that's okay to me. Well, and I think too, um, in terms of like diversity and inclusion and so forth, we want to be cognizant of the fact that some people may uh, have been stay-at-home parents, may have taken a break in their career to raise uh, young children. So we definitely want to keep that, um, keep our eyes open in that way. I think, uh, like Logan was saying, it's really like the, the one year or so. If we can see in your resume uh, that there is a pattern of you jumping from job to job, that's when we start to worry and say, you know, are they leaving the job because they got fired, you know, or are they just not happy in any of these positions? Those are the questions we start asking ourselves. Um, but otherwise, um, and the other thing too, is when I went to grad school, there were a lot of people who were going into librarianship or records management as a second career. Um, I was on the young end. And um, so I think a lot of uh, search committees are gonna be aware of that and be um, open to that. And as I said earlier, I think that's really a benefit. You know, um, Adam was saying how, you know, those of you who are fresh out of school, you have that perspective as a new librarian, but those of you who have worked in other fields, you also are bringing, um, even if you may not think so, I bet there are skills that and just attitudes that uh, in different perspectives that you will bring from your previous career. And I can do a current example. I am actually serving on a search committee right now. Um, and there was a person who had a very lengthy military career um, prior to going to library school uh, and stepping into this field. And looking at what they listed, I'm like, I can definitely see how these are transferable skills to some of the things that they will be doing in this position. Uh, you know, it shows me they, they were a leader and like everything else. So if you feel it like you're reading that job description and you're like, you know what? what I did in this position really, really can tie in to what I'd be doing in this one, put it there. Um, and for someone who has a military background, because I've, I've gotten this question before, if you were part of like special ops or something and you cannot talk about what you did, it is fine. Just address it into your cover letter um, that I was in the military. I cannot talk about these years. That's fine. <laughs> Very far and few in between, but I, I, you know, if you need to address it, address it. All right, let me move on to the next slide. Uh, okay, Adam, if you wanna talk about that. Yeah, so just a little bit of education experience continued here, um, just some helpful hints. Uh, let your employers know the how uh, provides a much greater understanding of your abilities. You know, how did you develop or design or create um, or implement plans, programs, or services. Uh, focus on that process. Um, how did your employers benefit from your efforts? You know, can, can you quantify your results? Um, some ideas that may help include, you know, did your results uh, generate increased interest, uh, increase uh, traffic flow, increase engagement in, in the library or, um, or an online platform on the website? Uh, did they improve efficiency? Uh, what, you know, you want to emphasize what kind of impact did they have? And, and can you provide some measurable results? Those always look really good. Um, you want to detail e each accomplishment. Um, what about the accomplishment? Make, what makes it stand out as something special? Uh, how did you become involved with that process? What did you do during that process? Um, how did you do it? Uh, and what did you enjoy about it ultimately? Um, and again, uh, were there any measurable outcomes in those accomplishments? Um, and always when you're talking about your accomplishments in this manner, try and prioritize them because you can't always mention everything. Uh, remember, your resume really should be maximum two pages, and those two pages go by fairly quickly. Um, so, you know, make sure you're prioritizing uh, what you want to mention, and again, tie them, tie those accomplishments 
to the position that you are applying for. All right, so a little bit of caution here. Um, try and avoid excessively generated statements. Um, avoid laying claim to any improvements without any explanation. Um, do not take any credit for progress without providing some element of detail. And again, this is sort of a pet peeve of mine. Uh, avoid using terms like excellent or superior, et cetera. Um, I, I just hate it when you when the phrase like, you know, I provided excellent service or a superior service. That, that doesn't really tell me anything about it. Um, so you want to expand upon that. This is not to say that your bullet points should be a paragraph. They shouldn't. Um, but, you know, I, I can't stand when I see things that, are, like Adam said, are just very general. Um, and if you can provide examples, like he said, uh, like if you did a project and um, you had a hundred people attend a program that you did, like say a hundred people attended the program, like give me a number. I like seeing that kind of stuff. And I think a lot of other folks do as well. So um, service. If you're in grad school, there's a good chance that you're uh, participating in all kinds of student organizations. At least I hope you are getting involved, uh, whether you're an online student um, or you're a seated student, make sure you're getting involved with a bunch of things. And if you can get on some committees or be a president of an organization, that's all service. Should you include it? Absolutely. Um, because in at least in academic work, we have a lot of committees and you will be expected to be on committees um, to probably access, right? Um, so if you have that kind of experience, that looks really great. Um, and if you had a leadership position there, even better. Uh, so an example I can give, you know, in a job description requirements person, in this position will be expected to work well in teams or and serve on committees. Some relevant service you might provide is you were um, on an academic programs committee in school and you were a student representative and in bullet points include what you did. Um, so definitely, definitely include service if you have it, it looks great. Um, usually I would put that uh, after your library and other relevant experiences. Yeah, just, just to build off of that, it, the, the included service, the extra service, it, it really makes it look like you are engaged, that you're, you're in, active in the field. Um, yeah, it, it just, it looks really good. It's not just padding for the resume at all. Oh, everyone's uh, favorite question, resume versus CV, what's the difference? Um, as Adam said, a resume really should only be two pages. And most folks coming out of grad school, um, you know, especially if you are more, uh, this isn't a second career for you, um, your resume probably will be only a page, page and a half, maybe two pages. Um, a CV is really for someone who's been at it for a while. Um, Logan added here on our slide that CV means life story and when. Um, so it is excessively long. Um, it's important to note what they're asking for. Um, most entry-level jobs are going to ask for a resume. Some will put resume or CV. So if you have a CV, go ahead and include it. Um, you know, that's gonna include things like if you have pu uh, publications, presentations, if you taught courses, guest lectured, um, anything like that will be included on a CV. Uh, whereas your resume, again, is, is more just that snapshot of, you know, your history of work and uh, skills that you might possess that are job uh, relevant to the job that you're applying for. If anyone wants to add anything to that. Uh, one thing I will add um, is what I'd call alternate resumes or CVs. Like if you have a website that you regularly update with your activities, I know there was a question in the chat earlier about providing links to um, like live guides that you created. That's an excellent place to provide those links. Um, if you have a, a web page, you know, a WordPress account, something like that, or even a LinkedIn account, 
Um, those are great places to keep up to date and provide links for um, in, in your resume, just for additional information uh, for the search committee. They, those look phenomenal. And you may want to include screenshots or PDFs, because if I click on that link and I see that somebody else owns it now, I no longer think it's yours. Uh, so especially if you created it on like SpringShare's demo site that's for training, that gets wiped periodically. So I would really make sure that you had a printed copy or a PDF um, and then a screenshot. And now we kind of want to address some, and we've had some questions about this. Um, what if I do not have any library experience? Well, um, there's a couple things that you can do, and I'm going to let somebody else jump in uh, and start answering this. <laughs> um, so when I graduated uh, with my library degree, I had absolutely no library experience except for like required um, internship. Um, and at the time I couldn't find a job. I, it was like over a year before I finally found a job. So I just volunteered at the local public library and I taught, um, computer skills to seniors. Um, so that kind of got me, you know, in the library environment and got me used to some teaching skills. I, um, I attended professional development sessions that were online. Um, SUNY Law and many other library associations, they have free trainings. So if you don't have a lot of experience and need to kind of pad up your resume a little bit, you can put online trainings that you've, uh, that you've attended. Um, that demonstrates that you have a dedication to uh, the profession and you're actively trying to better yourself and stay current. Um, so my, uh, my suggestion is to get library experience, even if you have to volunteer. And, um, and also apply, you may have to apply to part-time positions, even if you have a, a full-time position right now, um, you may have to start out with a part-time library position because those are the type of positions that don't require a lot of experience. Uh, I agree. And I also say if you're still in library school and there's opportunity to get a, do a practicum, I know that that's not always built into um, all programs, um, but if there is the opportunity to get that practical experience and um, either work within the library, uh, the university, um, so work within the library that's on your, your campus, um, go ahead and do that. Look for those positions or our assistantships or opportunities. Um, but also look like Jocelyn said at your public libraries. Um, if you can do clerical work starting off um, as a clerk, um, that's library experience, right? Um, so just find a foot in the door somewhere um, to gain the relevant experience that you're going to need as you progress through your uh, career in libraries. Yeah, I, uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, I would say that every library is shorthanded. And so if you can reach out to your local libraries, whether it's public or academic, it doesn't matter, you know, let them know that you're looking for volunteer work. They will find something for you. <laughs> Absolutely find something for you. Libraries always need additional assistance. I also want to just put out there, I do know it's very privileged to say, look for volunteer work. Um, not everyone can afford to just do volunteer work. Um, you know, it doesn't fit into your schedule. You have other things going on and you need something paid look for the paid opportunities first, if that's where you're at. Um, if you're in a place in your life where you can do unpaid work, go ahead and do that. Um, but doing volunteer, don't feel like it's the be all end all to get experience that you have to take unpaid work. That's not the case. All right. And then of course, just a reminder, <laughs> this goes for cover letters and uh, for resumes and anything that you're gonna submit anywhere, make sure you proofread, uh, have somebody else read it, um, read it through it yourself a couple of times, make sure there's not any typos. Those do stick out like a sore thumb um, to folks that are reviewing. And you know, if you could be just as qualified as someone else, but they don't have any typos in their cover letter. <laughs> Some people are a little petty about that. So just 
make sure you're you're you know logan says he is so <laughs> yes especially if you get my college name wrong <laughs> yeah yeah make sure you know what college you know if you're putting that in your cover letter um especially the sunnis because we're like weird like university at albany is the correct thing for my university um do not address us that as you albany um if you're going to to do that uh put university at albany parentheses you albany um and then you can use you albany throughout the rest of your your uh cover letter if you want to um but make sure you don't put university of albany uh ua things like that and that's the same for other institutions as well yeah, I, I don't think we can stress this enough, the, the whole proofread thing on your resume and your cover letter. You know, these are supposed to be examples of the best work you are capable of producing. You know, the, the, these, these are representations of your accumulative knowledge, personal knowledge and experience, you know, and it tells someone else what you can do and what you're like and what you're capable of. Um, the hiring committee or whoever is reviewing the document, you know, they will see your resume and your cover letter as reflections of you. Uh, and if it is full of errors, you know, what does this mean about the quality of your everyday work? Um, so yeah, so attention to detail is extremely important. Um, always take some time and have others review it, whether it's other librarians, other, other peers in general, um, friends or family, uh, you will be absolutely shocked um, as to what another pair of eyes can find in, in your document. And to piggyback on what Adam just said, um, I think, especially if you're applying for something internal, uh, don't assume that you have it on lock. Um, like Adam said, you really want to make sure you're presenting the best, um, you know, in order to evaluate the candidates fairly, we need to base our evaluations on the application materials, um, not necessarily our personal experience with that person. Um, so like Adam said, you really want to bring your A game to your application materials. So next we're going to hop over to cover letter basics and Laura and Logan will be leading this section. Okay, um, we're gonna speed through this a little, but a lot of what's in this section we've talked about in other sections, but in the interest of time and breakout rooms, which are coming, um, I wanna move us through this. Cover letter basics, don't reuse your cover letters, right? Uh, you can reuse chunks, but draft a new one, spend the time. Let us know you care enough about us to write a new cover letter for us. Um, and talk about how you can help up there, our library, start that way. Um, one of the best advice I got was when I was in a workshop like this and someone said, treat the whole process sort of like you would a first date. You wouldn't walk up on your first date to the other person. So like if I were going on a date with Amanda, I wouldn't walk up and say, I'm amazing. You should just want everything about me. I could do all of these things, bye. Right. You, you want to let the university know you know something about it. So in your cover letter, you're setting up the story and you're saying, I saw this posting. Thank you for posting it. Uh, I've looked at your qualifications and I really think you'll see that my application materials will help you make a decision. Uh, proofread, proofread, proofread. You know, I purposely misspelled it. That's why they're sick. Uh, have someone else read it. Wait 24 hours. I never send a cover letter the day I finish it, uh, which also means you have to be aware of the closing date. Um, but with SUNY, the closing date is the closing date. We have to look at everything that comes in before the closing date. Uh, and we've talked about spelling the name of the institution correctly. We use, we're now back to SUNY Brockport, but for 10 years, we were the college at Brockport. And if somebody put SUNY Brockport, we immediately knew that they didn't take the time to even look at how we named ourselves in the job posting, right? Uh, and more than one page is okay. 
Um, I've seen a new style recently where people will actually like add headings throughout with the required qualifications and give a two to three sentence response. Uh, it's long, but it, it actually helps the interview committee know that you meet each of those. Don't go more than two, three pages if you're taking that route. We don't need your whole life story for each one. Uh, but we do need to know that you can address each of the things. And we also want to know something interesting about yourself that you're willing to share. Like Jocelyn said, stories are memorable. Your cover letter should, I, I should know who I'm inviting to campus through your cover letter. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to structure your cover letter. Um, when you are addressing your letter, you know, right at the beginning, uh, if the uh, search committee chair's name is listed in the job description, which it often is, um, you can address it to them, uh, you know, say, dear Ms. Harris, uh, and by the way, don't assume ever Mrs. or Miss, you know, I would say if you're going to use, you know, if you're not going to use the person's name, make sure you use um, something general like Ms. And if they have a name like um, Jordan or something that could be uh, either gender, maybe they're non-binary, uh, in that case, don't guess, just, just use their first name. Um, and then add in other members of the search committee. Uh, mention that the position you're applying for, I usually will say, you know, I saw uh, your posting for such and such on, ALA job list or wherever I saw it. Um, what I have seen in a lot of the cover letters I've reviewed uh, on the search committees that I've been on, uh, if somebody is graduating, um, you know, they don't have that MLS yet, they'll usually put that in the intro and say, you know, I will be receiving my MLS in, in December or something like that. So because, um, and I think Jocelyn mentioned this, we can What's important to us is that you have the MLS by the time you start your job. So um, mentioning that is fine. Otherwise, um, I don't think we need to mention it. I never mention, you know, I have an MLS. It's um, the vast majority, like 99.9% .9 of the librarian positions require the master's degree. So I usually let my CV speak for myself in that regard. Um, and then you can add a segue into the discussion of how to meet the jobs requirements. And if you just go to the next slide. Um, this is uh, one that I actually used for my current position. Um, and Dr. Morrison was the uh, search committee chair. Um, I indicated the position I was applying for. Um, very brief, you can see, I just said, I believe I can be an asset and I'll tell you why. Um, we can go to the next slide. So the bulk of your letter is gonna be talking about how you meet qualifications. Um, if you don't meet the preferred qualifications, that's okay. Um, I think it does depend. I mean, obviously I think most search committees would if somebody met the preferred qualifications, but we'll, we'll also be happy if they meet the required. You know, we usually get people who meet the required qualifications and then maybe one or two or three of the preferred. Um, and the other thing I wanna mention um, is make sure you address all the instructions mentioned in the job ad. Take your time to read the job ad very carefully. And I'm talking again from my experience as a search committee chair and a search committee member. Uh, our library, our university requires um, people to um, talk about their uh, experience with diversity and inclusion. There's very specific language is under a heading that says additional instructions. Um, and I can't tell you how many applicants we get who just ignore that. There's somebody who has applied a few times uh, for a bunch of different jobs and they've never included a diversity statement. And I'm like, it's very frustrating and it's an automatic disqualification. So, and I think that goes back to the attention to detail thing. If you're not following all the instructions, did you read, did you read them? So make sure you read the job description carefully and that you are addressing things like that. 
Um, and the example Logan mentioned um, the heading and then describe of you know the required qualifications and then describing how you meet that. I've been doing that for. I mean, I haven't applied for a job recently, um, but that's basically what I have done. Um, it has worked out very well for me. Um, I've gotten a lot of interviews from that. And I think as somebody, again, sitting on the other side, as somebody who's involved with the hiring, it really does make the job of the search committee easier because what we do, we have a spreadsheet with all the qualifications at the top and the applicants on the left. And so we just say, you know, did they meet it? And if we don't have to go digging through your resume or your cover letter to figure out whether you meet that, that just makes it easier for us. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. Um, and Logan already mentioned this, write a unique cover letter for every position um, because it just makes sense. If there are different required qualifications, then you wanna make sure you're addressing the qualifications for that specific um, uh, position. Yeah, and if you do the the rec, the qualification and then description, make sure you still start it as a letter. Um, I don't know how I would react if I went to look at your cover letter and it literally just had your name at the top and then like the first question bolded, the first required qualification bolded. Just that little introduction with that little segue is enough. It doesn't have to be yep. very detailed. And we can go to the next. And then the closing, just reiterate your enthusiasm for the position, um, provide your contact information. You know, I usually say, we can go to the next slide. Um, and again, this is from my uh, letter for my current position. Um, you know, just thanking them for taking the time to read your letter. Um, you can see, you know, when I say delighted and passionate, I'm showing my enthusiasm um, and, don't assume, like, I kind of find this annoying, it's my pet peeve. Don't say, you know, don't act as if they're definitely going to call you. Like, I think having some confidence is okay. Um, but you can say something like, please feel free to contact me at blah, 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 if you would like to discuss my uh, the position with me or something like that. Um, so don't automatically assume you're going to call you. Uh, yeah, so that's typically uh, how I will structure a cover letter. And um, obviously you don't have to follow this to a T, um, but I think it's an overall good structure. And we have some example cover letters um, which you guys will be able to uh, look at. Those are all linked. This will be sent out um, along with the recording for this. So uh, no worries if you haven't been taking notes, uh, we'll get sent out to all participants. Um, and there are our resume examples for, uh, we forgot them and re-added them, but it didn't show up in this uh, presentation, uh, but they will be. Um, and the other one uh, to note uh, a little bit of a note on the resume ones, um, Adam and I kind of uh, decided to include examples um, from our post-graduation resumes. So you can see what we did right after we graduated from library school and the resumes that we were using. And I like to include that just because it's kind of like a tool of like, this, everybody starts out somewhere, right? Um, you're not gonna have the, the perfect resume going forward. And, you know, it kind of gives you an example of the, uh, I, I think this is more helpful than including my current resume because I've had a lot of stuff since I uh, began my career in librarianship. And I think it's more helpful to see um, where somebody started out and this is the library experience that I had, or this is the kind of experience I had when I just got out of grad school. Um, and how maybe you can structure a resume uh, going forward. And it was a resume that got me uh, a job, so. I'll say I included, I didn't have my resume from 2007 um, around anymore, or I didn't want to dig through hard drives to find it. Uh, so I included one that I interviewed for, but did not take the position. Um, and it was for a supervisor level, just so that you had that as an option. Um, and as far as cover letters go, um, you have like one for an instructional design, digital education. Um, and I decided to include one that I wrote for um, when I was an internal candidate. Uh, someone mentioned in chat that I do have a, an experience where I took professional positions to get my foot in the door in an academic institution. And then I started to applying to librarian positions as they were opening up. Um, and this was a, a, a cover letter that I wrote 
having working working in the institution in which I was applying for a position. So it's a little bit different of a situation of things you might say in a, in a cover letter like that. And I will say, if you are an internal candidate, that is the only time you're allowed to use your work email address um, because you are affiliated as a member of the institution. Um, but use a personal email address. I don't put phone numbers or addresses on much. Realize that whatever you send will be photocopied and shared with a large audience. So if you don't want the world to have your cell phone number, that's okay. Uh, you will enter all of that into the online application system. Uh, back before online application systems existed, it was important to include your contact details so they could get a hold of you. But now when they go to get you or they go to reach out, they'll look in the system if they don't have the phone number um, on the on your application materials. Oh, and a, a note again on emails. Um, don't use your school email address because it might take you, like the academic hiring process is very, very long a lot of times. And you might not have access to that email anymore by the time the process completes and you don't want to run into that issue. So use something like you have a professional Gmail email, use that. Um, definitely don't use like Hot Librarian 2 or something like that because that doesn't look great. Um, so, you know, use your like something like your name, combination of letters or something like that, or numbers and letters. Um, you know, not Hot Librarian Girl 2 at Hotmail or something. Yeah, I go with the very simple loganrath at me.com. All right, so if you're not getting interviews, um, well, you might wanna ask someone to start reviewing your materials uh, to see if there's anything you can add or something that you can do better. Um, there are a lot of career service offices, depending on what institution you're at, go check them out, um, hit them up for some um, you know, help. Uh, and ALA also has a resume review service, so take advantage of that. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, just hang in there. Um, something is bound, uh, you know, to happen for you. Um, and it's a normal part of the job process uh, to feel discouraged at some point, um, but you just gotta keep on going uh, and you will get that position, I promise. Uh, it does take a while for me personally. Um, I think I lucked out. I wound up getting a job um, five months out of grad school, but that was because I, I took whatever offer came first. Uh, do not hold out for that librarian position right off the bat necessarily. If there is a professional position, a clerical position, something to get your foot in the door, take advantage of that opportunity, get the experience. Any experience is good experience. Um, and if you have to play the long game, that's what I did. I did three years in a professional position before I had a librarian position uh, in which I was able to step into. Um, so do it, get the money. Yeah, those bills are coming due, right? <laughs> so uh, take what you can. Yeah, if you're graduating in May, start applying in November or December. Um, my job at Brockport that I have now, I applied in November for an April start. Like it just takes forever. Um, but at the same, at the same um, time, don't email every two weeks. I know one of the tips I got was follow up. Let them know you're still interested. Don't. The system do will, we will, we will reach out. And if you're not hearing from us, it could be because it's taking us forever. But if it's been six, seven months, you didn't make it. I'm sorry. And we also can't tell people they didn't move on until the search ends. Uh, sometimes we can, if you ended up in the C pile, we use A, B, or C. If you were in the C pile, a lot of times we can send a, we're not considering you at this time email, but we can't tell you, I'm sorry, until the end. Yeah, another note on rejections, I, I want to say, do not take rejections personally. Don't do it. Um, there are a lot of factors at play, um, application pool, uh, search committee composition, internal candidates. Um, so yeah, if, if, you, if you are getting rejected, do not take it personally. Yeah. COVID, COVID rejected. Uh, my okay. husband and I were doing a national job search in February of 2020. And I got four emails from institutions that said, this search has been postponed. 
Yeah, yep. that, that's a common occurrence right now. It's been mm -hmm. a common occurrence the past year and a half. Yeah, do you know that we are, you know, all living through extraordinary times. So that's definitely going to be a factor, um, at least for all of your job searches, um, which I, I'm so sorry, uh, that does add a, an extra layer of complication and stress. Um, but like I said, just breathe, um, hang in there and something is bound to open up and you'll get the job. The last thing I wanna share is be careful of how you come off during your interviews. You don't want to come off as the complainer. So yes, it may suck that you have applied several places and this is the first place to call you back or your current work situation might be toxic. The new people don't want to hear that from you. Um, it is a red flag if someone shows up and at lunch or dinner with the search committee, they're just, it's a long list of complaining. Um, so try to frame everything positive, um, especially if you end up having to turn down the position, even though they really wanted you because of salary negotiations, um, come off as positive and professional as you can. Yep. Oh, I, just, I don't uh, think anyone uh, mentioned it. And I, so I just wanna add, um, if you are in an interview situation and there is a meal, you are still on, you are still being interviewed. Um, do not let your guard down. Um, you know, it's a little bit more informal, but it's, you're still being interviewed, even if you're eating. So and, you know. and choose your meal accordingly. Yes. Um, like one of the things that I actually had some practice with in my undergrad was eating red sauce with a white shirt on. Uh, because you might have to present after lunch and I would not harm a candidate or think anything less if a candidate took their big napkin and like tucked it in like a bit, you know, it's going to let me know that they're a real human and that's not going to be what factors into the decision. What will factor into the decision is if we go to lunch and then all of a sudden you're on your phone while we're waiting for the meal. Mm -hmm. um, we do want to get to break rooms, uh, but first, thank you all for, for attending. Um, here is some conduct information for all of us. Um, if you're not a member of SUNY Law, what are you waiting for? Become a member. It's free for students for two years. Um, definitely check out our website uh, for information on joining. Please, please, please join us. Um, we do have social media presence at SUNY Law on Twitter, and then we're also on Facebook. Um, and our conferences have scholarships for library school students too. So, uh, and if, even if you don't have, get a scholarship, we try to keep it, uh, really cheap. Um, uh, and we try to keep it to, for library school students, it's usually 60 to $80 for three days of conference, including some meals. So ample opportunity, um, some extra resources. Again, this will all be sent out so you can actually click, click on the links. We included some common interview questions uh, linked to the brand new SUNY uh, Libraries job list, um, and then some other places that you can find jobs listed. Um, and then we want to know what kind of workshops uh, you think we should have next for students. So if you still have the link for the Jamboard, I think I can pop it in here again hop over there and let us know what kind of uh, workshops you'd like to see. I can share with you that in the spring, we are planning a future Librarians Day where we will have panels of folks from all different areas uh, of academic libraries uh, in different departments and different kinds of universities, community colleges, colleges, universities, um, technical services, access services, all that kind of stuff. Um, talking about their jobs and what they like about them and you know, kind of explaining what they do so you can get a sense of, you know, maybe what you want to do in the future. Diversity, yes, that is a very hot topic. So Amanda, in the interest of time, would it make sense to jump us into breakout rooms yeah. and then review this at the end? Yes, sure thing. We can definitely do that.